Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host today, Ashley Giordano, and I have a very special guest with me today. If you flip to the masthead of Overland Journal magazine, you will see a name, Tina Overacker, our editor-in-chief. You may have also seen a couple of her articles floating around in the journal and on the portal. Thank you so much for joining me here today, Tina. Good morning, Ashley. I'm so excited to talk to you today about everything. Everything. Let's do it. (laughs) And a special thanks to Dometic for supporting this week's podcast. When you're heading out, you don't want anything holding you back. Whether you're planning a week-long adventure or a quick overnight trip to your favorite outdoor spot, we've got you. The Medic's CFX3 powered cooler is designed with any size adventure in mind. The CFX3 allows you to bring more of your favorite food and drink along for the ride, no matter how far you plan to go. Available in different sizes, the CFX3 is built for the demands of outdoor use and comes with a handy app that gives you complete control at your fingertip. It's the state of the art designed for rugged use cooler that you can rely on and enjoy for years to come. So people are probably familiar with you if they're sending pitches in because you're most of the time their primary contact. How did you get here? How did you start working at Overland Journal? It's kind of a long story. I'll try and shorten it up. And it also took a lot of time to get where I am today. But I got an introduction to Stephanie because they were looking for someone to come in as a light copy editor at the Times. I remember the first people I met were actually Stephanie and Andre. At that time, Jonathan Hansen was just on his way out, as was Chris Marzoni. Chris Collard was on his way in. And in the very beginning, all I did was very light copy editing as an independent contractor five times a year as part of our final edit for each issue. So that really wasn't very much. And And then it gradually just progressed. I was working with Chris Collard pretty closely and he just started adding more and more responsibilities that he wanted from me, which was good because there was a time when I was thinking of leaving. That would have changed everything. That's how it started way back then. And now I'm at the point where, yes, I'm editor in chief. I can't remember how many years have gone by, probably 12. It took a while, but here I am and it feels like the right place to be. So you were based in Prescott, obviously. The whole time. The whole time. Okay, Mm -hmm. cool. And what did you do prior to this? Prior to running my little newspaper, Pop Rocket's. I just have done many things. I call myself a Jill of all trades. So I used to sell vintage clothing on eBay. I ran a store with my husband for a long time. I used to do research. Political science was my major. And so I spent some time That was kind of where I thought I wanted to be was doing research and writing. And it just didn't end up that way. I was also a social worker. I worked with refugees for a while, particularly Southeast Asian refugees and also all the Kosovars that came over at the time. So I've done a lot of different stuff. I basically just do whatever I feel is called upon me at the time to do. I've never let not doing something before stop me. Is this the longest period of time that you've spent doing kind of one thing? Pretty much. I was always attracted to journalism. I was always attracted to writing. I love reading. It was always one of my strong kind of strong pulls in terms of something that I wanted to do. And that's why I started my own paper as well. It's just funny where life takes you. So I was forced to sell my paper just due to circumstances at the time. I had a business partner that did all the graphics and I did all the editorial and he took up and left very suddenly and I had a six month old baby. And so like I said, ended up working for the paper that had bought my publication. And then it's just watching things come full circle. But as I said, I feel like I remember meeting Stephanie and Andre for the first time and walking into the office and thinking, I think this could turn into something. This may go somewhere. And it did. Like I said, it just took a little longer than I thought, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. That's awesome. What was the content of the newspaper? It was yours that you owned? Prescott is a fairly small town, but if you live in a city, you know, there's always those weeklies that tell you what's going on around town. So whether it's music, restaurants, things to do, a lot of times we'd incorporate trips, things to do in the area. Just what would you do if you were here, whether it be for a weekend or a local who's here forever? Nice. What did you you learn from that position? Like what was the most important thing that you took from that role or that experience before you came here? Maybe just knowing that I could do it, being able to run my own publication. It was kind of, it was a pretty big jump. It was a pretty big leap of faith. And so going from that and then segueing into where I am today, you know, it seemed like a natural thing to do. I've always been a good manager. That's something, another strong point of mine. Again, managing all those different aspects from editorial to advertising to whatever else was coming along. I mean, me and my business partner did it all. And that's a lot of how we work in this organization. Everyone wears a lot of hats. We're a small staff. We just make it work. We're a small team here yes. and uh, we wear a lot of hats. So what are the hats that you wear? <laughs> I've got a, a closet lot. full of them. <laughs> yeah, can um, confirm. <laughs> yes. It's mostly just doing whatever you need to do at the time. So obviously,
obviously I had to generalize. I'd call myself a fixer, like not in the Goodfellas mobster sort of way, but as in I will fix anything that needs to be fixed within my responsibilities of both Expedition Portal and Overland Journal. Scott said something to me recently that stuck with me and he said, one of my superpowers is gently moving things forward. And I feel that that is what I'm always trying to do. And again, with a small staff, sometimes that happens on a slower pace than you would like. My primary objective is to always move us forward as a team, actually, and make sure that the team is everything that they need so that we can all move forward together. I've seen that in practice. So (laughs) that's fun to hear too. And I think he has a good way of explaining or describing that moving things forward. How have you seen Overland Journal and Expedition Portal change because you've been here for over a decade and I'm sure that you've seen a lot of changes happening along the way? Well, it's funny because I say we have a small staff now, but we had an even smaller staff, say five years ago, right? So Chris Cordes, of course, did Portal. We had a managing editor, Sarah Ram. Obviously, we've had Chris Collard as editor-in-chief before, but I feel like we moved from a team of probably like three to five core people, and maybe we're now at like five to eight core people. That has been a change, and with that has come growth, which is really exciting. You know, now that we even have podcasts, that's a huge thing, right? And it's fantastic. You know, we've got the video support right now that we never had before. There's more and more people contributing to our magazine, more growth in general. And as everyone knows, the industry is exploding in the last couple of years, which is great. It gives us more resources to work with as well, so that we can keep growing. I just see a land of opportunity on all fronts. That's great. Yeah. It's at a time too, where I think that I've heard this quote, like, oh, print is dead, but I, it doesn't feel that way at all for Overland Journal. It feels like things continue to grow, which is great. It's true. I mean, print is largely dying. And I always feel fortunate that we have a print magazine that does so well. And I feel like it's sort of in a a space of its own. You know, it's almost more like a coffee table book. And we've got all of these components that make it wonderful. You know, design, the design element is so strong. It's not a magazine that you want to throw away. You want it on your coffee table. You want to look at it. You know, our editorial component also is getting stronger and bringing on staff editors like yourself and Matt Swartz. It just, we keep getting stronger. And I think actually that maybe we're having a small team as an asset because we do work so closely together and we all have our eye on the magazine. And I think that works for us. What does a typical day look like for you? A typical day? Well, it's a lot of reading and that changes, you know, the amount of hours. Yesterday I was in final edit for the summer 22 issue, which is a little bit more intense. So it was about 11 hours of very careful reading through our issue just to make sure everything was in line. It's hard to even break down. I'm, I will say that For I'm sure. in front of my desk way too much and I'd like to change that a little bit, but at this time, that's where I'm needed most. It's just in front of my desk. So whether it's email, setting up issues, copy editing, always copy editing during the day, whether it's for journal or expedition portal, going through and just managing all of the content that's coming in, where is it going, making sure our team has the support that it needs, trying to keep things on task. Do we have a bunch of gear sitting in our headquarters waiting to be reviewed? You know, where are our main good your reviews at the time. Who needs support? Where do I need to be? It's just constant. There is no typical day. What is it like to see a piece come to fruition? Because you see it come in as a pitch and you follow it all the way through the entire process. And it could be up to a year before it sees print sometimes because there are five issues per year. What is that like when you see that final product. Uh, it's very rewarding. Um, and also it can, it can change, you know, with that amount of time that goes by, it's almost like you're revisiting a piece again for the first time by the time it comes through to the edit of the specific issue that we're working on. You know, some pieces come in cleaner than others. Some pieces require quite a bit of work. And that's actually where I get a lot of satisfaction because I'm trying to make the piece be its best and I'm trying to help the writer be their best. And so a lot of times there's a lot of back and forth to see something come in one way, to see a writer work on it, see the team work on it and see the final product. And to see that whole transition is very fun. And maybe it's a little bit different than it was when it came in with a different focus. But again, it's making it the best that it can be, making the writer the best that they can be. And I get a lot of satisfaction from that. Yeah. The storytelling aspect of that is really interesting. I know because we've been working together on copy editing for a little while now and to see the writer's voice come through with that clarity just by making a few changes or, you know, they go back and work on it a little bit is, is pretty cool to see the final product come through. And there are a few things that I always tell writers and one of them is, is usually less is more. People can sometimes have a tendency to get wrapped up in what we call like the travel log aspect. I went here, I went there, I did this, I did that. And that's not so much what we're looking for. We're looking for the heart of a story and it can be one thing that happened on your journey or it can be several, but really it's putting the reader into your space. What did you experience, right? And so it really is. Sometimes I equate it to telling a story around a campfire because it changes every time, right? 
right? There are different nuances you might pick up on that you didn't the first time. But what do you want to say happened to you? What do you want to say about your journey? And it's conveying that and also bringing that emotional aspect to the story so that you're not just reading a journal entry, right? Or a diary entry. It puts the reader there. Okay. What is the perfect pitch? The perfect pitch is one that is complete, one that has all of the components that we ask for in the way that we ask for it. And what that does is it saves a lot of back and forth between me and the author. It also saves time and energy and work both for the author and for me. Again, as I kind of mentioned before, it's it's bringing the reader, a potential reader, into your story, into your experience, paying attention to not having that play-by-play aspect. That's very important. A lot of times people ask me, what's a region that hasn't been covered? Or, you know, where should I go? And that is important. You know, there are places that I feel like we've covered heavily, maybe too heavily, like Baja, for example. But what I always tell writers is if you can tell me something different about that place, if you can tell me something that no one has presented before, in the journal, we'll still consider it. In fact, I'll probably likely take it because it's a different perspective on something. It's still bringing something new. Anytime someone or a piece of writing brings something new, I don't care what it's about. I feel like it's valid. Yeah, that's a really good point. And when we're in editorial meetings, you know, something little like a photo link not working, like if we can't get access to the photos, then it's hard to know whether it's going to be, it's going to fly or not, you know? And those are things that I still do by accident, by the way. Well, and the (laughs) thing to remember too is the photography Photography is just as important as the writing. And that's what breaks my heart is if I have a fantastic piece of writing and this happens more often than you might think that there aren't the photos to support it. And then I can't do anything with it. And I understand, you know, photo is photography is not necessarily my strong point either. So sometimes writers have to really work on getting their photos up to where they need to be, or maybe they end up working with other people to get the photos that they need. But people don't always understand that, you know, they'll send me a fantastic story and it is a fantastic story. But without the photography element, we can't do anything with it. What are some of the most memorable pieces that you've read over the years? I have to say, because historical fiction is one of my favorite genres in history in general. I do like all of your historical pieces that you write, Ashley. All right. Yeah, score. (laughs) And then it's funny, too, because when I think of stories, I'm also thinking of ones that are coming up. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish, so I need to be careful. I don't give any... um, Anything away. Anything away. Top secret. (laughs) You know, I'm not one that's big on favorites. And honestly... I look at every issue as an independent thing. I don't have favorites and I mean that sincerely. So it's like any piece again that brings something new, I'm going to, I like, and I enjoy. I will say sometimes the more technical pieces, I know people really love them and they're important um, for the journal. It's a different type of reading. You got, you get into it, especially if you're working on it, right? Like a lot of it is what can you do for your build? Or, you know, we've had some amazing tests like the fridge freezer tests lately and it's all good. And I can honestly tell you that I don't have favorites. I know what you mean though about it's so cool that the journal has so many different contributing writers because some people really excel at the technical, they have a really technical focus, which is really important or have like engineering background or an ability to do a lot of math and make graphs. But then there's also the other side of like the creative storytelling part or a gear review where you have to be really honest and aware and put the time in to understand how the product works and what it's supposed to do. It's cool. Yeah, I can say, you know, to readers, some of the things that I think have been really valuable recently would be the photography articles that we've been running by Lisa Morris, just because Mm -hmm. I feel like it presents a huge advantage to people that want to learn basic photography skills. So I'm happy to be able to present that in the magazine. And we can enjoy the beautiful photos of Jason Stafford along the way. Yeah, Right. And then one that wasn't so much overland heavy that I thought was an amazing story was The Last of the Igu or the Igu by Antonia. Bolingbroke Kent, which was just such a complete immersion in that culture and just her, you know, going solo on her own. I mean, she did have a guide, you know, but still she was out there on her own just on the motorbikes and what they encountered was just fantastic and amazing. And it really brought home to me, at least my definition of travel, which is getting completely out there, immersing yourself hundred percent in local culture and going where no one has gone before. Dun, and, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> and you have some travel experience under your belt too. What are some of your most special travel experiences or memories? Well, again, I don't like to play favorites. I've traveled Latin America pretty heavily just because that was one of my areas of study. I would say more than a favorite, just perhaps one that was important was my first trip, which was, I was around 18 years old and I planned a trip to Belize. And that was my first trip out of the country. It was also the first time I'd seen the ocean. Most of my travels as a kid was, you know, we'd go see our relatives, which was also important and, you know, instilled this sense of belonging and that I really appreciated and loved. But we didn't do a lot of vacation or destinations. We did tons of road tripping. 
right? And I did tons of camping as a teenager, but this was my first out of country experience. It was just a lot of firsts and it was just being somewhere completely unknown. And I'll always remember it. I remember we were going to go to Tikal. Everybody goes to Tikal, right? If you're in that region, but it was rainy season because it was cheaper. And so the road had completely washed away. And so what I remember instead of going to Tikal is being in this little hut on a beach, which is where I was staying in a hurricane. And I would open the door from time to time. I was right on the ocean. And so all of the palm trees were bent all the way down to the beach level. Right. Wow. And then I'd shut the door and then I'd check like a couple hours later and all the palm trees were still done. So it was like, we just, we, we hung out in this hut for a day or two until the hurricane went away. And then just everything else, it was like the food and, you know, finding the guide to take us to the, you know, Lamanai, the ruins in the middle of nowhere and snorkeling for the first time and seeing a shark for the first time. And there were just a lot of firsts. And so we'll always stick with me. But what I realized then, if I didn't know it already is I love planning And so planning trips and, (laughs) you know, just the way to make it work. So I felt like it was important. And then a recent trip that I really enjoyed was um, I took my son who was eight at the time a few years ago to London. And that was really fun because it was experiencing everything through the eyes of a child. And I really loved that. And we just ran around like I, I was a kid too. You know, we were just running all over the place and just hitting as many cultural things as we could, museums and just hopping on the train and going out to castles. And it was really, really fun. So I enjoyed that as well. How has traveling changed? for you since you've had your son it sounds like you've been able to see travel through his eyes but are there any other do you do different trips or how has it changed he's a traveler and if circumstances had been different in the last few years we would have been globe trotting all over the place you know as it has been we go to mexico pretty often we're fortunate to be close to it and it's only about five hours away. And so we're often in Mexico and also just, we do a lot of cities. We'll go check out cities just because again, we live in a small town and I feel like that's an important aspect to introduce to him, but we just have fun no matter where we go. How old is he? He just turned 12. What does he love most about traveling? Just again, something new, experiencing something new, something that he hasn't before. And we just did a quick little trip this last weekend and whether it's a restaurant or a neighborhood, what's what we like to do is just find different neighborhoods to stay in. And then we completely immerse ourselves in them, whatever it has to offer. an escape room just for fun. It doesn't matter. It's just doing something that's out of your element, out of your norm. What inspires you about travel? Again, just the new experiences. And that's why, you know, if someone were to say, do you have a favorite trip? I would say no, because my favorite trip is the one that I'm on because of what I'm experiencing and because of what I'm doing. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's funny, I was thinking about it this morning. I wasn't sure what we were going to talk about, but you know, I read so much. I love reading. And what I've noticed though, is when I do have time off, all the books stay at home, unless I'm on a plane, I'll read then. But the difference is, is I'm out there living instead of, you know, reading my books and finding out what I can do or, you know, planning something. It's just, they all work stops, reading stops, life starts. I love that. I can really relate to that. I feel like if you're not in that travel period, you're like reading about other people traveling and getting (laughs) ideas and thinking of new places that you've never even thought of. That can be really inspiring. What's your favorite book? But you don't have favorites. So this probably won't work. I don't have favorites. So my favorite is whichever one I'm reading. Because I'll tell you, if I don't like a book, I stop reading it within (laughs) a couple of pages. And I found (laughs) that even when I make that kind of assessment and I pick it up, you know, a few days later, it never, I make that decision and it, it never improves. And so right now, I'm reading a book called Cloud Cuckoo Land, which I wouldn't say that I love, 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 but it's interesting enough for me to keep reading. It's not my favorite, but it's a good book. And then it's interesting too, like there are books that I've introduced to my son that I thought might be favorites, but I've come to realize this too. Like, you know, whenever you're reading a book, part of what makes you like it is probably the situation that you're in at the time or what your life experience is at the time. And so I'm reading The Night Circus to him right now, which I loved when I read it. I don't love it right now. (laughs) You know, like uh, there are certain genres that I love. I love magic. I love historical fiction in particular, but no, no favorites. I would say I do remember when my son's first book, and that is probably if I had to say a favorite, that is what it would be. I think it was the carrot seed or one of those kids books. Right. But I remember he was less than two and he was reading it and he was excited because he could do it and I can still hear his voice. And that was exciting to me, you know, was just seeing him enjoy reading as much as I do. And just, I mean, reading opens your life. Absolutely. In the historical fiction genre, are there any books you can think of that aren't your favorite, but maybe they like hooked you in right away and you didn't kind of. So it's funny because the way my brain works, I feel like my brain is kind of full. So I don't hold <laughs> on to things like yeah. titles, right? Sure. But I can tell you like there was one on Catherine the Great that I read that I thought was fantastic. I think the other thing too, is that books are so different. I also have a hard time figuring out like, what is my favorite book? Because I just, I don't have one, but I think you take little pieces of each one with you. Always things that 
that you do pick up on, you know, that resonate with you or that are important to you. So again, I don't care. Like this book that I'm reading right now, I don't love, but there are things that I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's taking, it's complex. It's taking all of these different characters and stories and interweaving them together. And there's a little bit of, it's not really history, you know, it's like Constantinople, but not really, <laughs> but it's like, you still have these little elements or kernels of, of truth actually, you know, and, and I love that. So again, I agree with you. You can always take something from a book. Yeah. And you can learn so much about writing by reading. Yes. And that's often when I make that assessment in those first couple of pages of when I'm going to keep reading a book or not, that is what's <laughs> happening. So for example, if I see a, I start out, you know, two or three pages and it's just, it's just words, 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 right? And it's not, there's no hook. There's no pulling me in. There's maybe a lot of descriptions, but without anything concrete behind them, I'll stop. Yeah. There's something about a good book there. You can't necessarily put your finger on it, but you must have a really long Goodreads list. <laughs> <laughs> no list, no list on the reads. Well, and it's funny too, because you know what I would consider a bad book wouldn't be a bad book to someone else. You know, it's very subjective, just like every, you know, everything else. And so, so much of it has to do with where you are in your life story and what's going on and you know, what makes it resonate with you. So I don't think no bad books, no right? bad books. I like that. Are there any places that you have gone back to multiple times or you keep being drawn to? I know you were saying that you like to experience new things, but are there those places where you return to time and time again? Well, fortunately, where I live is so central to a lot of, I mean, the American Southwest, if you're going to be somewhere, what a place to be. Absolutely. And especially with everything that's happened in the last couple of years. I lived in New Mexico for a while years ago and I revisited New Mexico pretty heavily the last couple of years. And I will always love that state. I joke that when you cross the border, from Arizona to New Mexico, the sky changes. It truly is the land of enchantment. And I just feel like everywhere I look, you know, there are things to do. You know, you just get in your vehicle, you could drive in any direction and find several beautiful, glorious things to do in New Mexico. And, you know, sometimes it's going to the little shrine like Chimayo or driving to Taos or it doesn't matter. I mean, the camping's great. It's just, it's all wonderful. And then Mexico, Puerto Penasco, what people call Rocky Point is one of my favorite places. I think it's one of that part of the Sea of Cortez, I think is one of the most beautiful oceans in the world. And it's so close to me and I will, I will always appreciate it. So we try to go at least a couple times a year, just run a beach house, stay on the beach, relax, do no nothing. Reading. No reading. <laughs> yeah. No reading. What is on your list next? Like what is, if you could travel anywhere right now, where would you go? Almost anywhere. <laughs> yeah. At this point. And it's funny, you know, as the world is opening up and we've kind of learned different ways to travel and different ways to plan and different ways to make things happen, which you know, it's part of being human. Our surroundings are always changing and that's just it. You know, it's, but I also recognize what's here in my own backyard as well. And so I really just value any experience, whether near or far that introduces something new to me. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. How has your role at Overland Journal changed you? What is the most profound thing that you've learned from your time here? That's an interesting question. I've always worked remotely. So sometimes I feel not not apart from the team, but I mean, we, a lot of us work remotely. I mean, Ashley, you're only here for a week, right? Matt, you know, he comes and goes as well. We've got a couple core staff members that are here most of the time. I guess maybe learning to work with people from a distance. I feel like that was maybe something new and valuable. And it didn't just start with a pandemic it was before. So it's a different way of working together, but again, has its own strengths that it brings to the organization. So I feel like that was valuable. Yeah. I think communication is key and any meetings that we have on a regular basis seem to be really helpful. And also just seeing people's faces, I think is really good consistently when you're all over the U S and Canada and all over the place. So. Yeah. And you know, I know I'm guilty of relying on email too much, perhaps. I think an in-person conversation is 
is better. I don't always have the time to do so, but that's something that I'm trying to change is having more in-person conversations, not necessarily Zoom meetings, but at least a phone call just to have that personal connection mm-hmm. because things also get lost in translation and email, whoever you're communicating with probably on both sides. So I like the in-person connection too. And I think as the world changes and as we all began Zooming, and I think it's important to hold on to those personal connections whenever we can take them. Absolutely. Yeah. Working from home, I I haven't been working as from home as long as you, but it definitely sometimes feels like you're in your own little world. (laughs) Well, and it's good because you can focus, right? If you have the right personality, it works quite well because, you know, you don't have things going on around you interrupting you. You can just strictly, and I feel like I can work at super speed. So I feel like maybe I get more work done that way. It's just good and bad, but yeah, it's just, it's a different way. It's a different way of working. And so again, just maintaining those human connections when possible. Is there anything else that you've learned maybe about the editorial process along the way. I feel like I learn a lot about people when I read their writing. It's almost a game to a certain extent. Like when I'm copy editing, it's what would this person say or, you know, what would they do? Or what? And because again, you know, I'm not working with them. They're not sitting right next to me. I do feel like I learn a lot about people and that is kind of fun. You know, with copy editing, with all the fact checking, you're learning something every day. So whether it's checking a date or a place or, you know, something that's happened in history or a name or it doesn't matter. And so often I'll go down little rabbit holes because I need to. But also I find that I find that fun just, you know, getting down to like the finite details of things. So, yes, yes. Yeah. The fact checking is interesting. Like you learn so much from it. I also do that. I go down a wormhole and then I'm like, okay, you got to get back to task here. But I think what is so great about, well, I want to speak for you, but part of what's great about what I do is learning all the time whether it's copy editing or whether it's learning about a place or somebody's experience in a place, it feels like you're always learning, which I think is important. Well, and then to a certain extent, it's bringing my experience of what I've just found out into the article too. So if I find something is particularly interesting, I want to share it with the reader as well. So it's bringing it into the article. I mean, I always run things by authors to make sure the changes that I do are fine with them, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to share knowledge. In your own pieces that you've written for Expedition Portal or Overland Journal, have you had any that have been particularly powerful or interesting or types that you'd like to do in the future? I enjoyed researching the Aloha Wanderwell piece in particular, Mm. but it was funny because there were things that came up that I I couldn't speak about in the article, things that were sort of like off limits, which made it challenging. And that was just kind of the way that the article was set up. There's sort of a mystery involved, right? And, And there are definitely things that the family wanted to keep private and, you know, that sort of thing. So it was kind of like diving into the mystery and making my own conclusions, but not having the satisfaction of making them known. (laughs) But still interesting nonetheless, you know, what what I was able to present. And she was a fascinating person. So I found that particularly fun. I guess you had to contact her family regarding photos or... Mm-hmm. history or her story. How do you approach somebody like that? Do you just fire off an email or what is your process when you're doing like research for those kind of historical pieces? You know, I'm trying to remember how that one came about. And I feel like maybe the family reached out to us actually, as I'm thinking about it. Oh, wow. So that one was a little bit easier, but again, it was kind of presenting the story in a factual manner, mm-hmm. you know, but in also in a way that pleased everyone. You mentioned the campfire story as a way to bring readers in and be interested in what you have to say. What are some really specific things that go into a campfire story that make a piece great? I guess why I make that campfire reference is it's more conversational. The telling of a story versus the writing of the story, which and sometimes they are one in the same. There's a method to it, right? So that's how you eliminate the play by play. I did this, I did that. Again, brings the reader more into your experience. And so how do you tell your story? You focus on what's important to you. Focus on what's important, I think, to the, the region that you are, to the people that you are. I mean, our voice says power. And I feel like whenever we go somewhere, I mean, we talk about this in the magazine pretty frequently. You need to be responsible. You need to be a steward. You need to be recognizing that you are a visitor in a place. It's not just about your experience in a way. Mm -hmm. It's about the experience that you're bringing both to the people around you while you're visiting and the cultures, but also to the reader. So I feel like it's an opportunity to present things and to do things in a way that can actually facilitate change. How do we experience something? What do we bring 
to that experience. I think those are both two very important components. Mm -hmm. And also feeling something like when you're reading something as a reader Mm -hmm. or an editor, it's important to, I think you want to feel something when you're reading. Well, right. Especially if you're not there, right? Yeah. (laughs) You know, maybe it's an interaction that you had with a person, you know, maybe it's, you were on a hillside on your own and you had some sort of, you don't have to tell me what the epiphany is, but there's, there's a quality of emotion. There's a way that you feel. And in our photo essays, for example, that's something that isn't heavy on text. Like we have very descriptive captions, but that's what we always say. Bring people into this moment. You know, the moment when this photograph was taking place, what were you feeling? What was going on? And it's like, that's what you have to look at. And it's also the human connection, I think too, in terms of if you're reading about somebody's experience and they're sharing what they're going through, most of the time you can relate or empathize. Writing really brings that connection with others. Yeah. I mean, we're all human. So we do have similarities across the board. And I think it's important to recognize that. And also, I mean, I don't think overlanders in general do this, but it's kind of just taking that tourist aspect out again, more immersing yourself in a culture. And you know, this from just going to Saudi Arabia. Mm. So how you dressed, it wasn't necessarily something that you needed to do, but you respected the culture that you were in. And you also said it more, it made it more comfortable for you as well. Right. Absolutely. It's little things like that. I feel like little things we do, it doesn't matter traveling or whatever. I feel like little things make a big difference in how we interact with each other makes a big difference. And again, it's, it's not just experiencing something. It's being the positive experience to someone else as well. I think that community aspect is important, whether you're in Saudi Arabia or you're at home, it makes a difference. Part of the point is to experience the unfamiliar, right? So while the unfamiliar may seem very unfamiliar and maybe not something that you're completely hundred percent behind, it's part of where you are. So wherever you are, you act accordingly. Overland Journal does some things regarding community here. And we have a lot of gear that piles up. Can you speak to what happens to that gear? Oh, it's funny. So we always try and walk the walk, right? I was actually one of our team members, Paula Burr, who was like, what, what's this, you know, recycling aspect and what are we really doing with that? And, you know, kind of not as it necessarily falls into leave no trace, but what are we doing on our end to kind of maintain some of these ideals that we're proponents of? And she brought up the fact that we had a lot of gear sitting around and um, it wasn't even just gear. Paula was all over it. She was like, (laughs) what are we doing with our paper products? You know, what are we doing with, you know, so it's just making sure that again, we were walking the walk, but she and I kind of got together. She had a friend that uh, works at a local high school. Coincidentally, they needed some camping gear. And so it was, we kind of vetted a few organizations locally to decide where was the best home for our gear. The other one that we chose was another organization called CCJ, which helps uh, the homeless population in our area. Again, vetted them a little bit just to find out what goes where in terms of money and profits. It's a difference where look at a rooftop tent, you know, a rooftop tent could actually be someone's home if it ends up in the right place. It's surprising what one conversation or one action can do. And I think sometimes we feel when there are big things going on in the world, it feels like it's hopeless. But if you can even make like that one little change or step, it actually feels pretty powerful. How did you meet Scott Brady? You said that you kind of came into OJ through Stephanie and Andre, which. Well, yeah. So what's funny is, like I said, I can even remember, I remember walking in the door to the office and where Andre was sitting and where Stephanie was, was sitting. And Stephanie at the time did a lot of management of the organization. But honestly, even after I met them that first time, most of my in-person and connection would have been with Chris Collard, right? Mm. So I didn't see Scott a lot. And I can't, I honestly can't tell you when the first time was <laughs> that I met him. He was always kind of flitting around. He travels a lot now. It was even more so back then. While I don't have a particular meeting that I can remember, I can tell you what I appreciate most about him as I've come to know him over the years. And that is that he is always working on helping his team in whatever way that he can when he can. Have you ever heard just even when you're speaking on the phone or maybe someone can't see you, but if you're speaking with a smile on your face, the difference that the conversation can happen just because on the other end, no matter that a person can see you or not, they still know there's just like something that happens, right? Like it's, it facilitates a positive conversation rather than a negative one. So if I'm writing my next article and I'm smiling, hopefully it'll translate. (laughs) Cool. Well, thank you so much, Tina, for coming on the Overland Journal podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And I think it's been really probably helpful for people to know who you are more than just a name and a masthead and what you look for. And there's a person behind all this magazine and portal, a little like wizard that's 
doing all the things and making things happen, moving things forward. So we're really grateful for you and for everything that you do. Well, thank you. And the one thing that I'd like to say to any aspiring writers out there is if you do want to submit a pitch to us, you can go to our website and um, you can find it quite easily, or you can even just Google Overland Journal Write For Us and the form will come up. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My door is always open. Sometimes it takes a couple of days, just depending on where I am at with my work schedule, but you're always free to ask questions. And I hope hope that you send in your content to us because we'd love to see it. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in today. You can find all that information in the show notes below and we will catch you next time. All right. Bye. Thanks, Ashley. Bye.